Hello Internet, welcome. I hope you're having some nice Easter holidays. Despite the unusual situation and we will use the time now to make some progress in the JB2 integer arithmetic decoding. So I, in the previous streams I did some infrastructure work. I switched to um, my own handmade test framework, which I'm quite happy with now. I have all my unit tests running on the new framework and now it's time to switch back to um, making some progress on the productive code. The last thing we did in the arithmetic decoding was that we implemented a first version at least of the arithmetic decoding of individual bits. So that is already working. We have here in our um, namespace arithmetic, so let me bring this up a bit, a bit larger. We have a quite straightforward implementation of what the JVIC2 standard specifies for arithmetic decoding. So we have uh, this um, function for uh, reading new input bytes and pushing them into the decoder. There's a renormalization function that is called whenever the interval length of the interval subdivision decoder becomes too small. And yeah, there is a simple initialization function and then there is the main decoding function um, which uh, does two main things. So one thing is the actual decoding algorithm that has a few cases uh, that it um, has to decide between. This is a straightforward implementation of the flowcharts from the standard. And then we have these tables and the purpose of these tables is to implement the state machine that does the probability estimate. So there's an adaptive probability estimate that is uh, calculated by the state machine. And <clears throat> of course this adaptive algorithm has to be exactly parallel, parallel to what the encoder did at the same time. So we always use the same interval subdivision as the uh, sorry, what the encoder did. And so we always use exactly the same interval subdivision that the encoder uses. And as a result, we can get exactly those decision bits out that the decoder encoded, uh, that the encoder encoded, sorry. I'm always mixing these, these words up. So we have state machine and basically small decision tree. And this gives us um, a single, the decoding of a single bit, but uh, actually we will need more because we need to decode integer values. Uh, and in fact, integer values of variable bit width. And there is a, um, there's an algorithm for that specified in a JVIC2 standard. This algorithm is built on top of this basic, uh, basic bit decoding. And let's see, I actually wanted to go where we use the decoder, ah, it's called arithmetic decode, not the other way around. So here we are at this point in the code, in a, in the code where we decode the first bit, but actually we will now um, implement the whole integer decoding algorithm here. And the most important point to understand here is the handling of contexts. The arithmetic bit 
encoding and decoding has this probability estimate, but this probability estimate only estimates the probability um, for getting a zero bit or a one bit respe respectively. And so let's let's make a sketch of that. So about the arithmetic uh, bit encoder and decoder estimate is the probability of having a one bit and with that of course also the probability of having a, a of getting a zero bit which is just one minus the probability of having a one bit and these probabilities for the arithmetic bit encoder do not depend on anything else the estimates for them are adapted but uh, in the end the idea is that the uh, uh, adaptation stabilizes at an optimal probability estimate uh, for um, a one bit or a zero bit respectively. Now of course in um, a complicated encoding decoding setting like the JVEC2 image format you cannot really come up with a good estimate for a one bit or a zero bit globally because it will depend a lot on the on the context uh, which bit and which value you are encoding or decoding how probable it is that the next bit will be a zero or a one and this is where this idea of the contexts come comes in so for each of the instances of arithmetic decoding in the JVEC2 standard we will have a table of context of contexts and each of these individual contexts has its own estimate of the probability of um, a one or a zero bit uh, being the, the next symbol. So in the end what we have is um, with the contexts we have probability estimates like this. We have the probability that we get a one bit given some history A or whatever the history is and probability of a one bit given some different history B and so on. So we have um, a set of possible um, histories that's and, and the specific history that we had selects one of these contexts and gives us the actual probability that we expect a one bit or a zero bit respectively. And what we will now implement is the, um, the handling of this array of contexts for the different histories and the selection of the, of the right context. And this depends a bit on um, the actual instance of the decoding procedure in the JVEC2 standard. So this, what, what is considered the, the history or the context so maybe I should I should call it context A or context B. It's it's the same idea. So it's that the context represents a certain uh, history of what what happened before in the encoding or decoding. <clears throat> and this has a different meaning depending on what we are actually decoding. So first we will do the integer decoding where the context uh, represents the previously decoded bits up to a certain limit. So actually in the case we will implement first we have a context uh, that is represented by a 9-bit number and this 9-bit number um, remembers the eight previous bits that I encoded and additionally a flag whether we have decoded more than eight bits, bits already or not. So that's, that makes up these um, 
these nine bits of that select the, the context for the integer decoding. And I don't know if I already defined the previous, because in the standard they call it, they call the, the variable previous. We will add something to the name to make it clear that this is a uh, should we call it the context index or something and according to the standard it is initialized to one which we could also write in binary as one two three four five six seven eight as eight zeros and a one because it's a uh, conceptually, it's a nine-bit number. This context, this context index, and then we have an array of so we have five hundred twelve possible nine-bit numbers. So we have a total of five hundred twelve contexts, and for now we will put them directly here. They will eventually live somewhere else because these contexts are actually um, not recreated every time we decode a number, but they remember information from previous um, decodings of numbers. So the, uh, the adaptive algorithm learns as we uh, go through the decoding of the, of the JPEG2 image. And just as the encoder learned while it, while it went through the encoding of the image. <clears throat> and I already have a, a struct for the context. Let's see where, where, where did I put it? Yeah, arithmetic context, context. So, so far we used only a single one and now we will actually, now we will actually have an array of these. So it will be an array of 512 and we, we will initialize them to zero. which is the correct initialization, but we shouldn't, in the end, we shouldn't do it here, but we should do it really at the beginning of the decoding. So then we have this index. And now for the first bit, uh, we should pass in contexts and we pass in a pointer to the context selected by the context index. And this should give us um, the correct first bit that we decode, which in this case is the uh, sign bit. So we can could actually call this the, the sign bit. And then we update the context index as defined in the standard. And they they defined it like this that if the context index is less than 256 then we just shift it left by one bit and or in the bit that we decoded otherwise We also or in the, the bit that we decoded and we set this flag bit. So we will do this a bit more, um, a bit more elegantly than we write it here. So first they 
for it and then yeah they mask to 500 the mask the lower nine bits and we set the, the bit number eight so if we directly if we directly write what they did in the standard it is this we um, we mask with 511 and then we set the bit number eight so i want to do this a bit differently i think we will do the masking at the end because this we can pull this in through the masking this doesn't change the result which has the advantage that we get the ors uh, next to each other <clears throat> actually it's not such a big advantage because this is a variable anyway but anyway I think it it is easier to understand this way and let's see if we can simplify this some more because I would like to do the the shift and or always let's see so if it is less than 256 then the new value is known to be so the new value is two times this plus one at most so the new value is smaller than So let's see if it is if it is smaller than two that means it's smaller or equal two hundred fifty five. So the mo the maximum that the previous context index can be afterwards is two times two fifty five plus one, and that should be five hundred eleven. otherwise if the value is at least 265 we also know that the value will always be at most 511 so then the new value is at least 512 so it could be 512 or 513 actually and yeah and higher values because uh, it can be up to 511 so what can be the, the largest one is this one right One thousand twenty three is the largest one that it can be. <clears throat> because I do not want to make this test before. So I think in the end we can we can shift first we can shift first and the only thing that we want to make sure is if 
if it is um, if it has an, an overflow then then we set this this marker bit and we mask so because in this case we know that bit um, 9 is set in all the cases here we have some cases where bit 8 is set but that is actually what we what we want So I think that should do the same thing. <clears throat> and I like it better I like it better than the version in the standard. Because it's clear that we will always afterwards um, our context index will always be less than five hundred twelve. Yeah, so let's use this for the update. And then we can actually decode the next bit. This is the first data bit. And this is what we, what we would expect, I think. So we would expect to get sign zero, then D1, D0, and then and then four value bits. So let's duplicate this for now. Once we, of course, later will do this in a more elegant way. Actually, I think we will be able to get rid of some of these tests because for the first few bits, we know that the, the context index cannot get too large because uh, we set it to one at the beginning. And so it, um, it can only grow by one, by one bit each time. So this check will only be needed in the later stages. So that's an option opportunity for optimization to get rid of this of this branch here okay let us uh, see what happens if we execute this code okay i should actually have used this in order to compile because then we have set up things to go to the first error um, yeah this is just stupid syntax error Okay, so let's run it. Um, okay, maybe, maybe I, yeah, I'm currently not executing this in the unit test, so let's change that. So we get a sign bit zero. 
then a d1 and a d0. That is exactly what we that is exactly what we expect. And if we look at the con and at the decoding procedure at the at the whole one, so we get a sine bit. Then we get a, a one and a zero. So we should read the next four bits and add four to them, and that gives us the final the final value, considering the sine. So this is working. Um, I think we can start to refactor this into a proper decoding function. Now one thing, one thing I don't know is whether the decoder state actually will, will, be, will persist across these different um, contexts. I think it will. I think it has to because the decoder state is what keeps track of the actual interval subdivision stuff. And this has to be persistent over uh, the whole bit stream, I think. So, so this initializing of the decoder is something that we will need to do outside of the integer decoding. This is something we need to do inside. So let us let us formulate this as a proper function. We will return a 64-bit integer. So what do we need? We need the status, we need the data stream, we need the, the bit source. We need the decoder. So what is the type here? Decoder registers. And we need a pointer to the context array. So that's our sign bit decoding. So then we will do this. We do not need this check because at this point we know that the previous context index is at most three. Or well, let's write it. Let's write it like this. 
or hexadecimal is maybe easier to read. So we don't need the special check. Okay, <clears throat> then let's get the first data bit. And now, if this bit is zero, we already have the first case here. <clears throat> so we extract the two bits. We actually need this outside. And I'm just thinking about how we could so. In this case, we do not need to update the previous context index at all. And in this case, so in this case, we need to update it. But the nice thing is, in this case, we actually, we actually know that D was a one. And so we can just go on with that. So we'll get the next bit. I'm just thinking of whether we could whether we could chain this instead of nesting it to make it maybe more readable. But we need to do this first. Yeah. <clears throat> Whatever. We can also. So next four plus four in this case. Next four bits plus four. Uh, let's write it like this. It's I think it's easier to see if the offset is at the beginning. Otherwise, we proceed with the decoding. And now we just have a very similar thing again. So here are the three, seven. We do the same thing again. We have at most four bits at this point. Six bits plus 20 is the next stage. Oh, this is the 20 and we have six bits from the bit stream.
And then we have again something like this. Here the one, and then we are at one F. Next stage is eight bits plus eighty four. Okay, another one, we have 3F, this is 12 bits plus 340. Okay, and that's actually it, because if this is this is not true. We have the the very high range with the thirty two bits plus four four three six. And actually, we, we will, um, in order not to have an overflow here, we should make this a 64. And so the only case in which we could pot potentially get an overflow is this one. So we we'll cast this to 64 bits. So we are sure we do not get an overflow in the addition. So this is unsigned. Yeah. Did I update the one F three? Actually, so okay. Okay. So we here we in no case, if I understand the argument correctly, in no case we have to actually do the check about the overflow of the previous context index. If I understand things correctly. And now we must deal with the sign bit. If the sign bit is set, we have a negative integer or the out of band. So if, if we have non-zero value bits, <coughs> If we have non-zero value bits, we have a negative, non-zero negative integer. Otherwise, we have the out of band, which we represent as the int 64 min value. So if sign is zero, we simply return V and we cast it to 64 bits signed. Uh, we know that we cannot have an overflow into the sign bit because the largest value that we can have is this 4436 plus U in32 max. So we can assert this here for documentation purposes. 
the largest that we can be is this 4436 plus, sorry, for typing so badly, plus u in 32 max. That's the maximum we can have here. So no problem with casting to a signed type. So that's it. We just, oh, last thing we need is the failure path. Uh, this is actually something we don't need. Okay, here I made a mistake because this, all of this should be one level further out. <clears throat> it's a bit larger than I would like to have it. Yeah, this can all be optimized very nicely because we actually know that this is one at this point, but this we will leave to the optimizer to find out. Okay, let's try it out. So this is gone. We still have this. Status, pitch stream, bits, decoder, context array. Oh, this is gone now. And let's see what we get. Because extract you and you try. Okay, this also has a prefix length. I forgot that. So the prefix length in this case is zero. We should get the decoded value six in this case. Yeah, decoded value is six, very nice. So at least for this value, it works. Of course, we get a failure because I have an assert force at the end, but uh, that's expected.
So this is working. <clears throat> so we can actually make some progress now on the... Okay, this is something we need to deal with also. But we will do this a bit later. Actually, the value we decoded now is the delta hit value. So let's handle this in common with the other case for the Huffman encoding, because I think the eight classes the hate classes are the same. It's just the difference is that we do not have a collective hate class bitmap in the case of the arithmetic decoding. So this value is actually the delta hate. Okay, some overflow checking. Okay, the next thing is the next thing that we decode is the, the delta width for the symbol. Here we again we again must differentiate between the Huffman decoding and the and the arithmetic decoding. Why am I typing so late today? That's the Huffman case. <coughs> Actually, we need braces because of the error checking here. This is also something that we need here. Even though we could combine, but this is an optimization for later that we could actually combine error checks. I do not want to deal with that level of detail right now, because anyway, a lot of work will probably need to go into making this thing fast and error checking is so far probably one of the least of our problems here. So let's think what we need in this case. The decoder needs probably to be initialized before all of that. So let's let's actually do this at the beginning. So here we do the Possible Dictionary. We do the Huffman table selection which actually only makes sense in the Huffman coded case. So this is also something that we could move inside an if. And alternative, alternatively we have this stuff. So the bit source, let's start the 
let's start a bit source earlier. Uh, let's have for now. Let's let's have this data here anyway. But what we we remove the initialization. So this we will have anyway, and the initialization we remove. Um, so um, so only if it uses Huffman coding, we will do this table selection stuff. That doesn't make sense otherwise. Otherwise, the symbol dictionary uses arithmetic coding. In this case, we will initialize the arithmetic coding data structures. And then we can get rid of this. And now actually we, we will start to need to differentiate between different contexts. So these are the IHDH, these are the contexts for the delta heat. But we will likewise, we will have 512 contexts for the delta width. And you can already see here that all of this will be quite slow probably because we have, so each context is two bytes. So we have one kilobyte of context for each of these decoding procedures. And there are lots of them. And now if you consider that the, the first level cage cache is typically 32 kilobyte. You can fill up the cache quite, quite quickly with this, this stuff. I mean, not, not all of it will be hot probably because there will be some rare cases, some contexts that you usually don't use. Actually, these, these structures, they, they could be smaller because I think we do not, we do not uh, actually use the full nine bits So let's make a note for later, because we will certainly gain from making these arrays smaller. But let's first get things working. I think we will, in the end, we will not allocate these arrays on the stack. We will move these to a persistent data structure that keeps these contexts for the whole JBIG2 data stream, I think. But the, we can do that later. So this is all gone. And we are only left with this. And here we use the IHDH contexts. Yeah, so this is getting nicer now. And here we have something very similar, but this uses the IHDW contexts. And let's for now do some debug prints that we can see uh, if our code is working. 
So we print the delta eight. And likewise, we will print the, the delta width. If this would be an optimized build, we would probably get some warnings about potentially uninitialized values at this point, but in the debug build, we don't get something like this. So we get an assertion failure, the variable that we used. Oh, yeah. Because here, um, I set the wrong variable, that's why. Get a delta eight, eight of six and a delta width of zero. No, I don't think that is correct. Let's go to the um, Sunbar Dictionary Decoding Procedure. And check if we do things correctly. Okay, we decode the delta, decode, decode the delta width for the symbol. I don't think this should be zero. Because if we look at the example, the symbols that are encoded here are actually these ones, I think these six by six symbols. Yeah, it's the same six by six symbols. So there's something wrong in our decoding. Now let's start the debug. Um, we need to go to, let's search for arithmetic integer decode. Uh, I ran the wrong file. That was just a test file for testing for testing the test framework. <laughs> Amazing how slow this output is. Okay, and let's take a look at what happens here. So first, let's actually step inside.
This is the first one that actually works. So sine is zero, that is fine. And then we get a one bit. Actually, I do a pastoral context. Then we should get a zero bit. We extract four bits and we get the six. That's fine. And the next bits in the reservoir at this point are actually zeros or zeros. <laughs> I'm just wondering if we do correctly mix the bits that are used in the arithmetic decoding and the bits that are directly read like these four bits. So that worked fine. So let's check what happens in the next case. So we decode the, the delta width. The question is whether we should really use the same the same decoder registers for this or whether we should have whether we should have a separate decoder register structure for that. Because here the, the next bits are all zero, what, what does the decoder say? The decoder still has six bits available. So the probability estimate is at 50%, which is what we expect at the beginning. <clears throat> so we get a sign bit zero, which seems fine. We went to state one. Still have bits available. So sign bit is zero. That that would be what I would expect.
So the decoder is still at the 50% estimate. Here we get another zero and here I, I would expect a one because should get the value six. It could just be that I misunderstand something. Uh, that I misunderstand something about how the they have arithmetically decoded bits and the literal data bits are interleaved. Or whether I misunderstand whether they are these are two separate decoders or whether we have one integer decoder here. Let's see if the standard says something more clear about that. Mm, sorry. integer decoding procedure uses a number of arithmetic decoding procedures each of these is used to the coding yeah so far this is clear each context for each decoding procedure has its own adaptive probability estimate. This we have because every procedure has its own array of contexts and each of these contexts, uh, each of these elements uh, represents one probability estimate. And this is clear. Each bit is decoded in a context formed from the particular integer arithmetic decoding procedure being invoked and the previous bits. Yeah, I think for the context we do all right, but separate sets of context is something that we understand. Okay, here they claim 512 bytes for the context memory. I 
I don't know if that is correct. Because we have a state and MPS. Okay, but the number of states is, we could compress this into one, into one byte. Because the number of states is 47, I think. So we only need uh, six bits for the state and we need one bit for the MPS. So we should probably pack this to get the context smaller, but that's for later. So strategy to untangle this mess is the following. First, we will look into the standard if there is a simpler example for integer decoding that we can test first. If there isn't, well, if there isn't, then we will uh, really need to decode the example by hand and see where our, our code deviates from the correct decoding. Uh, let's see if we have an example in the standard. So where did we have this example? I think it is in H2. Test sequence for arithmetic coder. Uh, 
but this is only at the bit level. And this we have tested and this works. So at this level we comply with the standard. So the problem is somewhere in problem is somewhere in the high level of the algorithm. So we just will have to go through it by hand. We are here in the symbol dictionary. This is the data we are working on. So let us Let us note this data down. Somewhere here where we start uh, decoding. I think we actually really start here with the 4F, right? Because we have no. So here we start the bit source. So this bit source should start out with this 4F. So the 4 and the first, I think. Three bytes should be used to initialize the arithmetic encoder. Let's search for init deck. So we get one byte and then we call byte in. This one byte ends up at bit offset 23, I think, overall. Yeah, because this one ends up at 15. So 8 plus 7, this ends up at 15. So let's see, 4F, um, goes into register C at bit offset 23. So this is this value, binary. This is this value goes into register C at bit offset 15. So the 
initial value of register C is Uh, we have 15 zeros fifteen zeros and then we have this value the zero one one until one 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 zero so So this goes with this one, if we group by four. This goes with this one here. Let's, let's put a marker because here we go to the next byte. One, 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 and so on, so zero. So it should look should look something like this. The C register. Let's see if this is what we get after initializing the decoder. So let's stop this for now. And let's go to the initialization of the decoder. So how does the decoder look like? Um, we have two, seven, F, three, eight, that's fine. A is the initial value. This is also fine. B is the last byte we read. And we have we have one one extra bit available that is not yet in the upper 16 bits. Yeah, this is this one bit. One um, bit available is not yet in the high 16 bits of C. That's fine. And this has the initial value of 8,000 hex. This is an interval size of interval length of 0.75. So far, we are good. Here we are currently um, at this point, so we have we have read these two bytes in. They are in the C register. Now we will just have to go through the stuff. That, that will be quite painful, but I don't see another option. And we will get a very good understanding of the arithmetic decoder by doing that. Sorry, someone is at the door.
Is the audio back? Yes. Okay, I got myself some sugar because the next hour will be a tough one, I think. We will go bit by bit through arithmetic decoding. We have the value of our C register. And I think what I want to do is I want to convert this value as a floating point number. Let's open our nice calculator here. I think this can do it. It's a little smaller. Let's try this. So we have zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, one, one. This is the floating point value. So the context, integer arithmetic decoding for delta h, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1. This is the context we are working with. This has currently an estimate of the more, more probable symbol being the zero bit, because that's the initial value. And it has a probability estimate of this one. Let's see what this corresponds to as a floating point number. Should be this and this, I think this is, is this half of the 0.75 Roughly, not really. Not quite. It's actually very close to a third, a third. So let's see if we uh, divide, what do I want to do? This is a third. I don't know really what the correct normalization is here. Because if, if a thousand hex corresponds to 0.75, yeah, okay, this is the normalization. So a thousand hex corresponds to 0.75 then this number corresponds to about 0.5. So this, the probability estimates are not scaled together with the interval. This is one of the inaccuracies that this implementation, that is 
uh, used by JBIG2 has is that the interval is um, not always exactly, not, does not always have the length of 1. It has a length between 0.75 and 1.5, but the probability calculations are all done as if the interval would have a length of 1. Uh, so there's a short explanation of this in the standard. Okay, and this makes sense. So let's copy this. Uh, so this means the probability estimate currently is this one. I actually don't know why, this, why speed crunch uses a comma instead of a point. I have it set to English, so why does it use the German convention for the comma? Six decimal, automatic. I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Let's not spend time on this. Okay, so we understand that the probability estimate at the beginning is neutral. It's as close to neutral probably as you can get with these 16 bits. Because if we would have zero, Okay, this, no, it's not, it could, could be made closer to, but for some reason they did not choose to make it closer to 50%. Whatever, it's the most neutral, at least it's the most neutral that the state machine can do. So let's start the actual decoding. And let's at the same time step through the code that does this decoding. Oh, it does no longer like my breakpoints because I modified the file. That's, that's horrible. So let's put this into a different file. And let's restart this. Let's build again. And let's then put this into a separate file. Let's put it in our to-do file. And Let's put it here. <clears throat> so we have the breakpoint at the right position. Initialization is okay, so let's skip this. Probability estimate is neutral. 
Okay, so first we subtract we subtract that from from the register A, which is the interval length. So what we calculate is the length of the new MPS interval. Two nine FF. So this is the first thing we do is new length of interval gets assigned to the length is A minus QE. Which is, I mean, it's it's a bit funny because a QE is always normalized to normalized to one, and the interval length is not exactly one. So what we get out is not quite the not quite the, the length of the MPS interval. So length of so should be approximately approximately the length of the interval corresponding to the more probable symbol what we get out here of MPS sub interval let's say and we get um, 29 FF now let's again convert that <coughs> to floating point But actually, no, actually we we must scale by 8,000 times 0.75. Yeah, it's about half of what it was before. which makes sense. What does it? No, it's not half what it was before because this was 0 0.75 and now it's 0 0.25 about. Yeah, so we see some inaccuracy of the algorithm. Because ideally the ide ideally the algorithm would have length one and the subinterval given the neutral probability estimate, the subinterval for the MPS would be 0.5 long. So we see here actually quite quite a strong deviation from the precise values. Okay, that was the first step. Let's also Let's also here go to the arithmetic decode code. So we are here. Uh, now we look at at the high the high part of C, which we already calculated. This is the two seven F three. That is this this one. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, I think we should convert this using the same scaling. As for so all the all the floating point scaling should be done. All the floating point scaling should be done like like 
like this that we have here. So that's actually what we should what we should consider the floating point value because it's always scaled that like that that eight thousand hex is point seven five. That's a bit confusing, but that's how the algorithm is defined. Okay, this is definitely, definitely much smaller than the probability estimate. is point five zero. I'm a bit confused currently, but let's let's go on and see how this develops. Because after subtracting the LPS probability, Because, I mean, the, the funny thing is that we have the case that the number we are looking at is less, uh, less than the LPS probability, which normally would mean that an LPS has been encoded, which I think in this case is not the case. And that's why we probably go into this strange exchange step here. Because we go into the LPS exchange. Because normally this would mean the LPS has been de decoded, but, but, but A itself is so small the interval length is so small that we have the, the other case. And this exchange step, this is something I do not yet fully understand. Because normally for the LPS, we, for the LPS, we would go to this branch. Um, 
Um, so let's now see high is in the LPS sub interval, but due to low A, due to the low interval length, we have this LPS exchange situation. This means we decode MPS, which is zero. We set A to the probability estimate. And the state, um, I think in this case, the state just advances to, to one. Which is now do we have the, the table? So state one is the 30% probability estimate. Because we, uh, we predict that the bit will be repeated basically with two thirds probability. Okay, so let's do this in the stepping. We are in this switching situation, uh, not switching, but we are, yeah, we, we decode an MPS, which is correct in this case because we need to get a zero signed bit. And the new state is one, yeah. Uh, we need to do a renormalization because the interval is smaller than 0.75 because this set the interval length to the This set the interval length to the LPS probability. And the LPS probability will, yeah, this will always be less than 0.75. So we always need to do the renormalization. We still have one bit available, so we should do just a shift. That is, we just multiply A and C by, by two. <coughs> so we do the shifts. And now A should become quite close to 1. So A should be in the end 2 times QE, which should be cl quite close to 1. And C C 
is shifted by one. <clears throat> so let's do it here. We have a part of it. A is shifted by one is AC AC zero two, which is approximately I think after doing all this I will understand this arithmetic decoder much better than I would actually like to. Yeah, so now the interval length is very close to one, which is usually what we want to have. And C is, this is 4FE7, So the new C is slightly below below a half, which I think, but it's but it's still above, it's still above a third, and a new a new probability estimate for the LPS is a third. So if the number is above a third, it means the MPS is encoded, which is actually true in this case. So that. That looks good. So here we decoded D equals zero. Okay, that was our first renormalization done here. So now A is large enough, we are done with the renormalization because there can be multiple steps required in the renormalization if A is too small. So we return zero. We switch to a new context. The new context New context is one zero. Yeah. So let's do the next decoding. We fetch the probability estimate, which is roughly thirty percent. Oh no, we are in a different context, so it is again 50%. Oh. So we actually get the least probable symbol, the less probable symbol now, because this was not correct what I said, because this is the context we leave behind. Um, we actually Switch to context I, H, D, H, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, to this one. And this is still in state 0. So QE for this one is still, so it's still about 5 uh, probability for LPS. And so now that the number C is below that, which means we actually encode the LPS. And the LPS in this case is one because the MPS is zero. So the code should 
spare that out. Okay, we again we subtract the LPS. So new new length of interval. The new A. Is five six zero one. Which is about point five. That's the new sub interval. Here we are smaller than that. And now A and the probability estimate are actually exactly the same. So we skip this and we go to the LPS. Yeah, so in both of these cases, the A is set to the LPS. In other cases, we should have a different thing. In other cases, A is not set by hand, which makes sense because this actually pre this pre calculates uh, this pre calculates the MPS sub interval. This is something that I should note in the code later. This is actually the an approximation of what, what the new sub interval length would be if it is the MPS interval. And that's why in the LPS branch it is always overwritten with the LPS because this should be about one minus, yeah, exactly. And here it is overridden. And now we decode an, a less probable symbol, which is in this case the, the one. So <coughs> decode, let's write here, decode MPS zero. Decode LPS one. Okay, and we actually do the switch now because we are at the neutral probability and we saw that actually we get a one, so we do the switch. Switch um, MPS to one. Yeah, this is what we do here. So the new MPS in this context is one. And next date will also be one in this case. Which means about a 30% probability for the LPS, which now is zero. Here we had LPS one because we didn't do the switch. So it's actually expecting to get ones. Again, we, we need to renormalize because the interval is now at 0.5 and we need to get it up to about one. So we will renormalize. We have no bits left.
no bit left, so this means we do a byte in. Okay, I wonder if this is actually correct here, because now the next byte we should look at is the OC, and here we are still dealing with the E7. This could be a potential bug. I need to look at the byte in because here we should have incremented. Okay, here we increment the byte pointer. Okay, no, this is still okay because the byte pointer has not been incremented here. It's fine. That's fine. It's strange, but it's fine. So B is still the last. The previous byte we actually already incorporated into the C register. And it's not FF. So now let's get the next byte. That's the ACE 8C, yeah. So we read the new B, the new B is the eight C. Yeah. And this gets added to so this gets written here, the 8C. So with 8C, this is put here. So let's highlight this somehow. This is where we put the new byte. So it is available to be shifted into the C high because the C highs, the, the higher 16 bits are basically our working registers. And this is kind of a reservoir where the bits are waiting to, to get shifted in. So now we have eight bits in the reservoir. And now we shift we shift this in. So A is now again the AC02. Right, because here we had the point five. This is now very, uh, very close to one again, which is nice. And the C, C is shifted by one. So we see that actually the first bit of the new byte has moved into the working register. Yeah. This is a floating point value of, so we have nine F C F one eight. Let's say point one eight. A 
Okay, now we are at the very high, the very high end of the interval. Which normally should mean, if C is large, it means that in the next steps we usually get the more probable symbol. So A is large enough now. We're done renormalizing. We return a decoded value 1. We switch the context. We switch to context one. This is again a new one, so this is also a neutral context. Again, we estimate, this is the same as here, we estimate this here. But now we have the different situation. So A is about at 0.5 now, but we have a very large C. Um, a large C, so we should decode an MPS, which should be a zero. I think that's also what happens. So we go to the MPS path. Yeah, now large C decode an MPS. Um, C is C minus QE. The A we already calculated, yeah. So we are just <coughs> shifting to the new base point of the sub interval let's see what we get Four nine C E four nine C E one. So these bits are still in the reservoir, they are not modified by this subtraction. But this is strongly modified. Yeah, so the, the same bits are still waiting here. <clears throat> so the new interval is not in the valid range. We must make an MPS exchange. So 
Is A actually smaller than the LPS subintegral? No, I think not in this case. Is larger than QE. So we decode an MPS, which is zero in this case. And the state switches to one. We did not have a switch, so one is still the less probable symbol. Okay, we will need to renormalize. We still have bits available. Still seven bits available. The new C have a bit of a problem here with this. Can I copy this? Yeah. This is the new C. Again, the ACO2, right? Yeah. And CT gets six bits available. And that's the renormalization done. So we return the zero, did we not this decode? Yeah, we decoded the zero. So we have this four plus four bits. So integer decoding done. Um, integer, it's let's say the decision decoding done. So we had a sign of zero and then we had a one zero for bit integer. We now get, uh, we now must get the next from the stream. Where's our input position? <clears throat> we read four bytes, and this is exactly this nibble two uh, four bits. This is uh, this one, and the new input position is then in between here.
Okay. So we know that this is still the right one. So this will, let's see if how the bits looks like. The reservoir is two zero, two zero. Yeah, that is fine. Two zero zero E, and then we have in the reservoir zero zero E is still in the reservoir. Yeah, that's also correct. That is all working fine. We return six. Delta height is six. So far, everything is correct. But now comes the difficult stuff. We continue decoding. With a new context. Because now we switch to context for delta width zero, zero, 001. This is a new context that is still neutral. So A is still roughly at one. So now it will get this one. What is C? C is relatively large. Yeah, C is large. So we go to the MPS exchange. That's like what we had here, large C. Uh, go to MPS exchange. Definitely, if we will code an MPS, it's still not clear. So we subtract the LPS. This is what we did here. Shift to new start position. We shift to the new start point of the interval. And we get um, this one. Which is this one. So the in, but but the interval is not in the valid range. So that's why we do the MPS exchange. The A should be exactly the QE probability. So decode an MPS of zero. That is still what we expect because we expect a, posit a positive number. So the sign bit should be zero, that's fine. And this new context will advance to state one. Yeah, that's what we expect. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
<coughs> we do a renormalization. We still have six bits available. So we'll do this. Still six bits available. Shift to five. But this is actually still the same. C is now this, which is a rather large number again. So, renormalization done, we return the sign bit that was zero, which so far is fine. The context advances to this one. We do another decoding. So C is again large, but A is not in a valid range, so we again expect an MPS exchange. And this is the problem. This is what we do not really because now we would expect a one. Okay, but that no. We could only get the one here in this branch. So we would need this. <laughs> so we go to new C is And that's the new C. A is not valid. It's greater than this, and therefore uh, we get the MPS. Hmm. And I think this value is wrong.
this value should be one. The question is just what is what is what is wrong? And could the new bytes that we read from the screen because so far but so far we actually have only read only read bytes from the beginning of the stream and not after the so the interleaving of the of the interleaving of the arithmetic decoding bits with the literal bits cannot be the cause of the problem because we haven't even read any bits after the first interleaved literal bits That width should be six. This should be one here. Uh, we are definitely using a new context that has never been used before. That we know for sure, because we have never before decoded a delta width, and we have never before encoded the second bit of a delta width, which is what we are doing here. So this cannot be wrong. The estimate must be neutral. So what are the ways, in which way could we get the correct value? We would have definitely to decode an LPS. In order to get anything that resembles a correct value. Let's see, in which cases do we decode an LPS? Here we decode MPS. Here we decode LPS, so that's one of the probable ones, one of the ones we that could be right. Here MPS, here LPS. So we have two possible cases that would give us the correct value. This one, this is for the small c values. So let's write this down. Cases that could give us the correct decoding LPS is which is a one. Um, low C a low C 
and the high A. That makes sense. So we, we would have a long interval and we would be, be at a very low point in the interval. That would definitely give us an LPS. That would be one of the We actually would, we actually, um, high A, okay, but the A, the A is already the subtracted one. High new A, so this is the, This is the A that is the estimate for the new MPS interval. Let's take another look at the algorithm. Where is it? I never find this algorithm. Why do I not find it? Ah, because I think it's in NXE. Yeah, NXE. No. No. Oh, I didn't find the NXE. Here it is. decoder <clears throat> so we always subtract so a is always the estimate of the new NPS interval if we would have a a low C We would go this path, path and we could get the LPS here. If the A is small. So if the new MPS interval This is something I don't really understand in this exchange algorithm. I would think that here we always get an LPS because we had a very low C value. But actually we have this case where the interval length It's really strange because here we estimated the new MPS interval. Mm. 
which is not used in this case really, except for this check here. Because we always set A to the, the LPS probability, which also makes sense because we, ha we are, the next interval is the, the small part, the LPS part. And C is not subtracted because we remain in the lower part. That all makes sense. What I don't understand is this, this part here. And that's actually the one we take in this case. Let's see if this is described some more here. Is the after the coin is the subsection one. Let's clear the amount left in the cold string is the offset from the base of the current interval to the sub interval allocated. Okay. Yeah, that's that's clear in the first. The C high register is compared to the size of the LPS sub interval. That's also very logical so far. Unless a conditional exchange is needed. Yeah, this conditional exchange, that's, that's the point that I don't really understand. So all of the first paragraph is clear. MPS LPS conditional exchange may have occurred. That's the strange thing. So we are here for the LPS path. Conditional exchange is this when you switch MPS and LPS. But the strange thing, they, they are not switched here because the switch looks like this. So the conditional exchange is something else. I need to understand this conditional exchange. So this paragraph is again clear. That's, that's just the basic way that arithmetic decoding is done. If you have an MPS, that's the upper sub-interval. You add the starting point of the sub-interval to the code string in the encoder. So that's what we then subtract again. That's, that makes sense. And the interval is reduced to A minus QE. That's also clear. So the first paragraph is clear. Can sometimes make the LPS subinterval larger than the MPS subinterval?
if for example point five. Okay, so the conditional exchange is If due to our approximations, we subtracted too much, because what we actually sub should subtract is the QE times A, so scaled by the interval length. But this is for efficiency reasons, this is not done. So we have the problem, if the A is already small, If the A is already small, this could overdo things, so we could get a too small interval here. So far I understand that. So the approximate scaling gives, gives one third of the interval to MPS. LPS and LPS intervals are exchanged whenever the LPS interval is larger than the MPS interval. That's really strange. What does it exactly mean that the intervals are exchanged? I thought the LPS is always put in the lower part. Hmm. <laughs> In the partitioning, the suborder is, is ordered above the subinterval. Therefore, blah blah blah. This is so strange, this conditional exchange. What do they exactly mean by exchanging the intervals? Because here they say <coughs> the subinterval MPS is ordered above the subinterval for the LPS. So that means if we let's draw this. So where do I want to be actually? It's never in the recent ones. Why? Why is it never in my recent ones? This is getting difficult. So let's 
we need to do some drawing. Let's create a white layer, a new one for us. So far my understanding was the following that oh this is much too large we have an interval that theoretically should go from 0 to 1 theoretically but actually it goes from 0 to to A. And we have here a larger part, normally should be the larger part, the larger part corresponds to the more probable symbol. That's the upper part. And the lower part corresponds to the less probable symbol. Theoretically, the dividing point here would be, sorry, I don't know about how I'm scrolling all the time, um, assuming. Theoretically, this dividing point should be QE, which is the estimated probability of the LPS times A. That would be the theoretical idea. And we have a if we encode um, an LPS, we put the code point here so that the number that we output, otherwise we put it here. We also calculate this one, that's the new A. Let's call it A prime. Then this is the estimate for the length of the subinterval for the MPS. And this is theoretically this would be A minus QE times A. But actually what we calculate, what we actually calculate is A minus QE. So actually, we are not using this precise dividing point, but we are using a point that is just QE. That would be right if A would be exactly one, but it, if A is smaller than one, then this point will lie to the to the right of the correct dividing point. And then we can have this strange this strange situation where actually this part which has the length a minus qe The A minus QE is actually the smaller part of the interval. So if 
a minus qe is smaller than qe. That's the strange case. That's the case that should cause the conditional exchange to happen. In the case we are looking at, we actually assume that the encoder has encoded a less probable symbol, which is the one that we need for the 4-bit long number. Because we want to get 0, 1 and 0 from the stream, I think. 0, 1 and 0. 0 we get, that's the sign bit, and then we get, want to get a 1, which actually is the less probable symbol. Um, so we do this calculation. Yeah, and then, then we check, is this actually too small? That's the strange case that I have drawn here. So we are so imprecise in using our dividing point that the dividing point actually would reduce the interval more strongly for the MPS than for the LPS. And that this is something that we do not want. We want to encode an LPS. So it should not get this very large interval. That would be counterproductive. And so this is, I think, the conditional exchange that the algorithm then says, OK, so let's give it this interval. Let's encode the LPS as if we were encoding an MPS with this inaccuracy, giving it a small interval. That's strange. Yeah, so I'm somehow touching something that just is zooming. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. So that's what's going on. The algorithm says, OK, I want to encode an LPS. Normally, this would mean put the code point here. And this will be our new interval. No, sorry. This will be our new interval because we are using this inaccurate dividing point, not the, not the theoretically accurate one. So this would be the new interval. However, due to our inaccuracy of using this wrong dividing point, our the new interval would actually be the, lar the larger part of the, in of the old interval. So um, that's not what we want for encoding an LPS. So what we do is we know that we want to encode an LPS, so we want a smaller interval, but we have to actually do this conditional exchange here and take this interval because this part is the smaller part. So we encode this part. We encode this part. I think now I understand the conditional exchange. So we do this 
we do what we normally would do for encoding an MPS because that gives us the smaller subinterval. Otherwise, everything is the same as here. It's just that we, we do the encoding as if we would encode an MPS. And the other case here should be the reverse, right? Normally for the MPS we do this, but in this case when we have this problem we actually do like we would encode an LPS. Okay, yeah, so now I understand the conditional exchange. This is just for this step, just doing this for this step. We switch over to the other subinterval because this is actually the smaller one. Now we must be very careful about off by one errors because we can have the case that is actually the case in our in our problem here. We can have the situation that first a is exactly two times QE. We calculate this new A, uh, which is a minus QE, which is exactly QE in this case. So in this case, both of the intervals have the same size. Both have exactly the same size. Then we don't do the conditional switch according to the encoder algorithm here. If it is the, if it's equal, we don't do the switch. So let's go through this again with our new understanding. We are in a new and neutral context. So QE is this value which is approximately 0.5. Um, A is exactly twice that value from the previous steps. I hope this is correct because this could of course also be also be a problem. We got this by shifting left from QE. And C is large. C is in the upper part. A is actually exactly QE. So we, we are not assuming a conditional exchange. Yeah. We are not as ex if we would if we would think it's an exchange, then we would actually get the correct value, but it's not. So is the problem that the C is large? Hmm. 
the C is large because we renormalized here. Wow, this is complicated. So many dependencies in this. Maybe I'm, I might be having a big misunderstanding here. That might be the problem. Um, because so far, maybe I'm completely misunderstanding the integer decoding because If it says it's the next two bits or the next four bits, I was thinking that those would be literal bits from the stream, but probably they are also encoded. So they are probably also encoded and that's probably the problem. Uh, let's let's try to work with this assumption. Sorry. <laughs> if this is the case then I really caused myself a lot of unnecessary trouble. Because here we always do the literal is extract and that probably is wrong. So let's do it in a different way. What we will do here is we will actually instead of doing this we will just say um, that the length we will just decode the length the length is 2 here just as the length is 4 here six here eight here twelve here and 32 here. So at the end here we have the length, not the V. And now we will just do a loop that decodes these, these next such and such many bits. So we will actually well, let's bring the V down. We will initialize this to zero. And then we will do a loop. Actually, we can do a while 
while we have a positive length. While we have a positive length. Oh, the next problem is we actually will need to update the previous context every time. Okay. So we had the zero. So we update the previous context with zero. It's still small enough, right? So here this is at most six. Yeah, let's just go through it like this. So here it says at most seven. So we update with a zero. So it is at most 14. Here we update with a zero. And it was at most 15. So it is at most um, 30, which is this one, one E. Still no problem. Another zero. It was one F, so now it is at most three E, right? Still no problem. Um, again, we update with a zero. It was at most three F. So now it is at most 7e. Still below 256. Uh, here we actually update with a 1. Sorry. It was at most 3f, so now it is most at most 7f. So after all of this, we know that this is at most 7f. We have, <clears throat> I think, the, so, yeah. so we have decoded at most six bits. Is this correct? How many decoder, uh, decodes do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, No, six. Here, yeah, that the sign bit is the sixth one. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six bits at most. <clears throat> That's fine. And if all of the six were one, we would have seven F. Because we have six one bits and then an additional one to mark the, the length. <clears throat> okay, so now we have the correct context. We decode another bit. We say V is V shift left one or D. So we push it into V. Oh, the offset is another thing we must decode. Wow, this is nasty. <clears throat> we update the context. But now we must actually do a full update.
we update it with D. And now we must must do the if previous context index. If it is this, then we make sure we make sure that the bit eight is set and we mask out everything above bit eight. <coughs> Okay, and this we just do until we have all the bits we need. And then we must actually well, let's call this rebase. We must actually also remember the, <coughs> the offset. That is four here. Twenty here. Wow, this will all be so slow. But first, this it must it must work. And hard to test this will be. So many cases. I hope they have some good reference data. Four, four, three, six. Yeah. So we increment v by the v base. This cannot overflow as we have everything in sixty four bits. Actually, we can assert this here. Because here we know that V is at most U int 32 max. And after adding the base, it is this one maximally. And let's See if we have something that works. Okay, for some for some reason. When I have a linker problem, I don't see the error yet. Ah, this is yeah a linker problem because it cannot open executable because we are debugging here. That's the problem. <coughs> I must fix that that I I get also the linker errors nicely in the in the Vim error window. Yeah, we have a delta width of six. It is working. That was the problem, people. <laughs> that was the stupid problem. I completely screwed up. And all of this would not have been necessary, except that I, you know why I did get this idea that, that this might be the problem is because here, I came to the conclusion that most likely the problem is that C has the, has the wrong content. That C is too large. C should, be some, should have been something else because the other things were really quiet. So the QE and the A, they were all very uninteresting values. So exactly the 0.5 probability and so on. And so I thought the problem is probably that C is such a large number. So something about the bits that we have in the Incoming is not right, and that was exactly the case. Wow, 
that was an unnecessarily long debugging session. But I think now it works and now I understand the conditional exchange. That's a plus. So what I will do now is I will take a short break and then I will go to the code and write comments that explain what I previously understood about the conditional exchange because I will for sure forget that again. And then let's clean up some code. So, I even mess up my break string. See you in a few minutes.
Are we back with audio? Yeah, sounds like it. So after this horrible debugging session, which um, had two results. So the first result was that I found out that the problem is actually something completely different than <laughs> what I thought initially. I thought initially that there was some small problem in the algorithm here, but the algorithm was actually correct. So the arithmetic decoding itself for the bits was correct. Um, so that was the first result that as often happens in a long debugging session at the end you discover that you were stupid about something completely different and the problem is elsewhere. That was the first result. The second result was uh, that I actually now completely understand the arithmetic decoding algorithm, I think, because I understand this strange conditional exchange case that <coughs> that is built into the algorithm. And we will use this now to write some comments documenting what is actually going on in the algorithm. So first let's explain that um, the register A um, gives the current interval length where A um, Bounds to point to a length of 0 0.75. <clears throat> so much is clear. So let's uh, draw the interval. Something like this. It's an interval from 0 to A. Um, the high 16 bits of the register C give the the value of the code string or what should I say So A and C have the same, A and the C high. So C high, which is the high six, 16 bits of the C register, gives the value of the code string in the same uh, scaling. So it looks something like this, that somewhere into this interval, somewhere in this interval, oh, this looks bad because it's a cursive font. We have the value, the number C pointing here. Uh, this looks horrible. Cannot really do something about it because the i is just the same slant. So this is the this is the situation we have at the beginning. Um, 
now. Um, the, the lower part of the interval corresponds to the LPS, the less probable symbol. And the upper part corresponds to the MPS, the more probable symbol. So we have here an LPS interval that should usually be smaller. And we have an MPS interval that is usually larger. <clears throat> the theoretical, or let's say the theoretically, no, let's say the theoretical precise dividing point between the two is a times QE, where QE is the probability estimate, or the, is the estimate for the LPS probability. So far, so good. But now comes the huge important point. The actual dividing point used by the algorithm is QE. So this point here is QE. Uh, theoretically, it should be A times QE. <clears throat> Thus, for For A, less than 1.0, I should some, somehow distinguish between A, the, the actual meaning of A and the, 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 the register value. So what is the register value here? This corresponds to 0.75. So Four, three, six, nine, zero. So the this is actually smaller than one. So if A is smaller than one, that means the theoretical dividing point 
is actually smaller than QE. Um, but this in turn means that the actual dividing point is um, too, too large. Uh, is it's to the to the right of the theoretical realm. Let's say it like this is to the right of the theoretical realm. That is the LPS interval is larger than. It should be or larger than its optimal size, let's say, for a greater than one. So this is register values greater than equal, probably with the b. Yeah, this is slightly greater than one. The actual dividing point is to the left of the theoretical one. That is, the LPS interval is smaller than its optimal size. Um, and here we can say um, this is not of of too much concern for us. If the LPS is even smaller than it should be, we, we simply accept that. However, the first case, if, so let's say this is case A, this is case B, this is a problem. Um, so let's decide some subcases. So this is QE. And what I also want to write here is that this, uh, this distance is a minus QE. This distance is a minus QE, but this distance is QE. So we have case a1 and maybe we should we should do it like this too and then we have 1a um, <clears throat> that is the case a the case one the first case is a is still greater than or equal qe then the LPS is um, at most as large as the MPS interval. 
and it says sub interval then the mps sub interval let's always call it sub interval is maybe yeah sub interval is larger than its optimal size smaller than its optimal size so this case poses no problems so let's say no problem but 1b if a is smaller than qe then the lps sub interval is actually larger than the mps sub interval and that's the important point In this case, the algorithm uh, performs a so-called conditional exchange, which means that an LPS will be coded by using the MPS sub interval so the that's the smaller one the smaller MPS uh, and MPS will be coded by you well let's say is coded because will be coded would be more for the for the encoder but here we are talking about the decoder so mps is coded using the larger lps sub interval that is the conditional exchange case and now i understand it that's important to know and i think i described it more clearly than it is described in the standard <clears throat> it's a diagram of the coding interval with the actual dividing point being shown. So, and now we can now now we can um, actually document the steps that the algorithm does so first what it does here is set a to the length of the mps sub interval <clears throat> if c is now smaller than qe this means the code point c I don't know if code point is a good word here. The code say so the value of the code string uh, points to the LPS interval. 
something to do. This this is clear. And then let's remove these names because they are a bit misleading. These are, those are directly from the standard. Um, so if A is smaller than this, then we actually have the conditional exchange case. Conditional exchange case. So let this is important. Um, we have an MPS that is that has been encoded by using the LPS sub interval. That's why we decode MPS, but we switch to the we switch to the sub interval for LPS. Actually, we could call it <clears throat> a kind of rec recursion because the interval is recursively divided. Recurs into the LPS subinterval. So C remains unchanged, but A changes. The other way is um, this is something we should maybe describe above. Um, the algorithm proceeds by recursively subdividing the coding interval. So it can either recurse into the LPS sub interval by setting A to QE and leaving C unchanged. Or recurse into the MPS subinterval by setting A to QE minus A and setting C to C minus QE. That's quite logical. Let's say it either recurses into the LPS or it recurses into the MPS subinterval. Yeah, and this is actually done. At the, so first it first it calculates the MPS. Interval. Yeah, here we have the conditional exchange case. We have an MPS that has been encoded by using the LPS subinterval. Now it's very clear. So we do the recursion, recurse into the LPS subinterval, um, but otherwise treat this as an MPS. Yeah, that's the this strange switched case. Otherwise, it's just an LPS. So let's not say this, here, but it's just an LPS. Regularly encoded LPS. Uh, 
recurs into the LPS sub interval. If we are at a non thermal neutral probability estimate state and switch our opinion about the more probable symbol. Yeah, so if we are, yeah, exactly, if we are at a neutral point and we get the, low, the less probable symbol, we switch our opinion. Very nice, we understand things. And in this case, we always need a renormalization. Because, because either a is smaller than the QE probability estimate. The QE probability estimate is always at most 0.5. So here we know that A is at most 0.5. So it's definitely too small. So recursing recursing into the smaller interval of the two will always need a renormalization. Yeah, in either case, a, the new value of A is the QE probability estimate. So in either case, we recurse into the in either case, we recurse into the LPS sub interval, which actually means that we can do this here, right? Because this is done in both cases. And we do not use A in between. interval but otherwise but otherwise treat this as an MPS yeah recurs into the LPS sub interval as we recursed into the smaller sub interval Uh, wait, um, wait, wait, wait. We have an MPS that has been included, encoded by using the LPS sub interval. But that means the LPS interval was actually the larger one of the two. Oh, but this. It was the larger one. So we cannot say that we recursed into the smaller sub interval. The only thing that we can say is that whatever, even if it was the larger of the two, it was definitely shorter than 0.5. Well, no, it was shorter than 0.75 because A could be as large as 1.5. And the 1.5 is exclusive, I think. The new 
interval length a is definitely smaller than 0.75 in this case so we need to normalize because either it was the either it was the smaller one the smaller interval is always less than 0.75 unless they are exactly the same even if they are exactly the same the 1.5 is probably exclusive yeah the 1.5 is exclusive so we know here um, a is less than equal the u in 16 marks So the interval length is interval length it is at most this. Is this an exact? Could be an exact value, right? Should be exact because the three fourth should pose no problems. times three fourths times four thirds yeah it's an exact value interval length is so Therefore, the length of the, the smaller subinterval is less than 0.75. This much we know. And also, also in the strange case, a is smaller than QE. And then, then even the larger I think I made a mistake here. This should be two times, right? Two times. Because we subtract QE. A minus QE, yeah. If A is smaller than two times QE, then a minus qe yeah is, is less than qe that's right so if this is the case a is smaller than two times qe
then the larger interval is actually the QE. And QE is definitely smaller than 0.75. The LPS interval has length QE. So, yeah, yeah, for the length of the smallest one. Um, the length of the LPS sub interval QE is is less than or equal to the strange number five six over one. which is definitely smaller than 0 0.75, the length of the LPS, even if the LPS had sub interval happens to be the larger of the two as described in the point won't be above. Yeah, now we have it watertight. So so in both of these cases, in this case, C node above. Yeah, so that's watertight. We definitely are below 0.75 in this case. Okay, let's do the other case. The value of the code point points into the MPS sub interval. So we recurse into it, or this sub interval. That's this one. Um, if the interval is still large enough, still large enough to be in the valid range. This is the nicest case, so this this should be the hot path. So ideally we always subtract a very small number here because the LPS probability is small and then we can often do we can often do this case. So both the C and also the A are only reduced by a small number each time. So we have few renormalizations ideally, and often we have this path. The new interval length. And here, this is the conditional exchange case. In the other direction, we have an LPS that has been encoded by using the MPS subinterval. We recurse into the MPS interval, but otherwise treat this as an LPS. It's actually this case.
we trade it as an LPS. This is part of having the LPS. So if it is conditional, can this actually be the case here? I think yes, right? Because could we be at a neutral probability A is less than 0.5? Yeah, I think we could we switch. Else. Okay, the else case is a normal NPS case, but we will need renormalization. We have an MPS, but the remaining MPS sub interval is so small as to require renormalization below. Um, in this case, we also update the probability estimate. So the, the probability estimate is updated when either the predictor was wrong, so actually the LPS occurred, or when the MPS subinterval becomes becomes very small, which is a hint that we are underestimating the, that, the in, that the encoder has been underestimating the MPS probability. This is also something for understanding the algorithm. Uh, so let's write that. The, the small MPS, the sm smallness of the remaining MPS sub-interval can be a hint that the encoder underestimated the pro probability of the MPS. Therefore, it will have both Decoder and decoder do an update of the probability estimate at this point. Yeah, and and if if we recurs into the smaller interval anyway need a renormalization. Okay, now I completely understand this algorithm. That's also progress, not in the code, but in my head. And I mean, now also in the code because we have commented everything so that I understand this the next time. And, and especially what is very important because at one point, I will probably have to make this algorithm faster. And then it is, of course, very important to really understand it. So here we should actually call this C high. The C high is the pointer that points to, to one of the subintervals.
Now, these cases are definitely wrong, so they are gone. Okay, I think we have a correct integer arithmetic integer decoding algorithm now. Let's see if it still compiles. And then the next step will be do, to do actually do the arithmetic bitmap decoding, which is the next story. So it compiles. Let us execute. Yeah, we get the correct width. That's fine. And now the problem is the next step is to actually decode the bitmap. Because integers are not the only thing that is arithmetically encoded. But also bitmaps are some dictionary decoding. Also bitmaps are arithmetically encoded because it will look like this. We have the hate class, we have the delta width, and then we have actually the bitmap encoded, and then we have a delta width and another bitmap. <coughs> so so far we have the delta width. Six, five, eight. We must decode a bitmap as described in six, five, eight. Symbol bitmap. And then we have again two two forms of this. This is crazy. Yeah. First we will do the direct direct coded symbol bitmap. And here we use the generic region decoding in the arithmetic variant. This will be the adventure for next time to do the, the bitmap decoding. Is there any way that we could um, Is there any way we could do another test whether our integer arithmetic decoding is correct? Now the problem is we cannot get to the next symbol because for that we need to decode the bitmap. And we do not know the length of the bitmap, I think, without, without really decoding it. So we have the symbol dictionary data. Yeah, we cannot really find out where the... Because the end marker is really only at the end. So we have no way without decoding the bitmap, we have no way to know where, it, where the bitmap ends and the next delta width begins.
can we do more clean up in the last remaining minutes Yeah, one thing I still need to comment about is the bit stuffing. Because I think I now understand what the bit stuffing does. The problem is the following. If you look at the arithmetic encoder, then whenever it encodes an MPS, it adds something to the C register. So theoretically, the number in the C register gets larger and larger and larger. Of course, this runs into problems on any, on any CPU architecture. And so what the algorithm does is it takes the higher bits and puts them into the output. But the problem is if you add and add and add, you can have carries. And theoretically, there is no limit to how far the carries can ripple. And so you would need, if you have a, a carry ripple very far, it could ripple into the data that you have already shifted to the output. And this would invalidate the output that you have already produ produced and you would have to start over and so on. So um, what they do instead is a technique called um, bit stuffing. <clears throat> this is done in the output routine. Let's see if we can find it. So the renormalization grows the C and it causes the byte out. Yeah. And the byte out has a special case so i think this is the bit stuffing case So if the previously produced output byte was already all once, then I'm a bit confused which case is exactly the bit stuffing case. Because here we have a kind of carry. So if C is very large, if it's not not less than this number so it is at least this number so if you shift it you would produce a carry 
then b is incremented by 1. And if we reach the maximum value that the bit can have, that the byte can have, then we go into this bit stuffing case. Yeah. We output this byte and we actually the next byte is actually farther to the left in C as, as in a normal case. Yeah, I still need to fully understand this, but this is a kind of carry mechanism. So the carry instead of rippling into the rest of, because here we would actually, if, if B equals FF, the next increment would actually cause an overflow and would invalidate the output data. Because B is the, B is the only byte that we can modify. All the ones that are to the left of it, they have already been pushed to the produced output. So if we reach the maximum and we know that any further carry would cause a problem, then we do this, this case. Okay, this is still something that I, I need to become completely clear about how to describe this here. And the bit stuffing in the, in the stream that we get looks like this, that we have an FF and then the next byte is rather small. Because if you have an FF and the next byte is also very large, that means we actually reach the end of the stream. And, um, okay, I have to take a break at least, or maybe even I will finish the streaming for today. We got a working arithmetic integer decoding. So I call it a success, even though the debugging was very painful. So, um, See you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.